After Paradox dropped Victoria 3's 1.1 update a few days ago, we've been slapped in the face again with an update of two parts. Nice. Firstly, we're learning about some features that will be included in the next update, patch 1.2, and these are all about war. Coming probably, you know, in the next month or two. And then we hear about some more experimental features. Sit back and relax and let me take you through the updates that came out of Paradox Interactive today. They start by telling us that after they locked down the final 1.1 patch build, they decided to run something called the Vicky 3 Feature Game Jam. Basically what this was was an opportunity for some of their developers to work on something that they'd like to see in the game, their own initiative. Sometimes high impact tweaks, uh, other times UI elements, new game content, buildings, that kind of thing. For the game jam though, they were tasked essentially with two pieces of criteria. The first one was that they had to work from people across the, the team, across disciplines. And then the second one was that they only had a week to come up with the changes. This is a fast and loose experiment of two parts. The important disclaimer here as we go any further is to mention that only a few of the features will be included in patch 1.2. We'll start with those ones. The rest of them are considered prototypes or experimental features that would take too much work to implement right now. Maybe they need some supporting code or something like that to really get them to work properly, but we can consider them an experiment, a peek behind the curtain, and you'll hear a little bit more detail about that as we move through, how they might use some cool changes to springboard further advancements. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's take a look at the changes that will be coming, at least in patch 1.2. And this is coming from Team War Never Changes, with a set of experimental enhancements to the military system. And in the spirit of finding fast, quick, and impactful solutions, they identified two problems. Uh, the first one was that combat units on a front line have a 20% chance of suffering 5 to 15% casualties and 2% per week from attrition alone. It sounded like too much. The second one was that generals were being picked based on the number of battalions they had rather than other things that could be impacting their strength. Think their own personal traits or morale, that big thing that was just updated in the last patch. So to implement some effect, they thought they could try and have simultaneous battles play out on one front. In the spirit of the game jam to get it working, they made it so that when battle advancement progresses, we spawn two battles in different states, as long as you have at least two advancing generals. Funny and chaotic, it works, but it also affects the rhythm of war. The advancing side has some advantages, for example. They also added the ability of locking province captures to the state where the battle actually happens. So if you're fighting on a certain front line, that province will be captured. Again, it's fun as it looks like a well-planned out military invasion, but currently has the effect of capturing the whole state most of the time. So you get the idea that they're trying to make quick changes that will implement meaningful things, particularly around those first ones about what the generals are doing, how they're advancing. That makes sense and should deliver a better player experience. All, of course, in the spirit of what they're calling the game dev jam, that, that quick burst to try and find fast solutions. The second half of the military game jam experience is brought to us in the form of more player-facing changes, communicating information more readily and easily to us, and removing some of those crucial pain points around combat. Uh, here they highlight war exhaustion, attrition, Equipment modifiers, generals and troops selected for basically everything, right? <laughs> it's kind of kind of across the board. The first experimental change relates to the uh, essentially the size of a front line. The longer the size of the front line, the more battles that should be and will be occurring across it. Kind of syncing those two together makes a lot of sense. Here there are some specific changes, I'm going to read them verbatim. Another goal was to attempt to increase the information that the player could easily see. First was to include the advancement bar of the opposing side to the front tab so that it can be seen there as well. That one, by the way, a brief interlude makes a lot of sense. Secondly, uh, and additionally, I wanted the player to have more information on the battle screen. For this, we added a demoralized count for units. We noticed it might be confusing for the player to see that they started a battle with 15k troops, only to see that they have lost the battle but only showed that 3k died and 6k were wounded. But at the end of the battle, it shows that you have zero troops remaining. Uh, this is a common sticking point, actually, and misunderstanding for a lot of players. 
I think that makes a great deal of sense that they reflect those troops who you have on the front line, but they are just simply broken, demoralized, rather than being physically wounded. This is a, a sort of a real way for the game to reflect some of those changes that have hopefully been taking place behind the scenes, around morale, for example, again, one of the big things that they've tweaked in that last major update. And then there are three kind of fast and loose changes mentioned at the end here. The first is that they wanted to look at the ticking of war exhaustion. Uh, they felt as though one province could sometimes have an impact on the overall effect. Uh, there's a lot that they'd like to change, but for now they focused on lowering the values of the numbers while increasing the impact that the loss of men has on the overall nation's war exhaustion. That is, of course, massive in playing out to achieving or failing to achieve your overall war goals. The second was around the adjustment modifier. That's when you adjust your equipment and your troops kind of need to get used to it, right? They need to retrain or, or what have you. Uh, this was added, of course, to stop players from just turning their army completely off, dialing it down, spending not a dime on it, and then quickly ramping it back up again without suffering any penalty. So it makes sense that it needs to be in the game. But there is a, a somewhat unfortunate side effect whereby sometimes it just, just feels like you're taking far too long to train units, right? There needed to be a bit of balance that discouraged players from turning it off and on and off and on, but also made sure that we weren't spending far too long, ridiculously long, training up troops in general. Changes here should help to adjust that. The penalty is worse for the primary PM, but all other PMs will have a smaller one. Nice. And then finally, the final area in terms of war improvements uh, that will be hitting our shelves, <laughs> our games in patch 1.2, uh, was generals and troops and how they're selected for certain battles. Inferior allied troops and their generals would often take the battle and tie down the front line. There are now additional checks in place to increase the chances of a general being picked, again based on traits and also some of those other things that we discussed at the start of the video, as well as the PMs of the troops under his command. So you can kind of see how these things are relating together and providing a suite of changes. Now, the changes that the team have made to various aspects of warfare will be made available in 1.2, okay? So these changes will be made available in the next patch. However, there's a caveat here, and it's a big one. They go on to say, and I'll read this word for word, but likely with multiple battles limited to single states turned off by default. If you'd like to experiment with multiple battles and or state limited battles, you'll easily be able to change some defines in the script file to do so or download a mod that does it for you. In the interim, we'll use this team's work to test and attempt to balance multiple battlefronts to see if we can make it a viable feature for the future without accidentally introducing game-destroying methods like whoever has the most generals wins. That is the synopsis of the changes that will be coming to war in Victoria 3's patch 1.2. However, of course, there are more experimental features that they've been playing around with, and they stretch across a variety of features inside of Victoria 3. A brief interlude, fun way to pass the time, and I think actually a nice flavour element to add to the livability of a world, particularly if it was scaled up. We have Team Cookie Clicker, consisting of a visual effects artist. His addition adds visual effects when you interact with certain parts of the terrain, and you can see it playing out on the little gif and clicking on the sand to make little clouds, the ocean splashing it about. Trivial. Yes. They go on to say that improving the interactivity of the map is something that they're interested in exploring further, and that they'll use this as a prototype for further exploration in the area. That's all we get on that one. I think it's a fun flavor element, personally. Is it game changing? No. Nice to see that could, could maybe, use it to springboard into some more exciting features down the line, though. Next up, we have a project titled Breaking Ground, and this experimental feature is looking at resources. Uh, what it attempts to do is take the discoverable or depletable resource system that we currently use for things like oil and rubber and gold, and then apply that to the capped resources in the game, uh, logging, mining, and fishing. Makes sense, perhaps, and as they move through to discuss it further, they note that forestry is by far the most fleshed out example that was built this week during the fest, so it makes sense that we talk about this one here. The intention is that forests around the world inside of Victoria 3 
are all accessible at the start of the game. So none of them are hidden, say, oil, gold, whatever, but can suffer from depletion, uh, a deforestation. And this kind of feels like it will add uh, a bit more nuance, more variety to the player experience. Uh, they go on to say that deforestation will be dependent upon things, again, that are related to our player experience, like if we have higher technologies that utilize better production values, then the resource is less likely to be depleted or increased likelihood of being depleted because we're chopping it down really, really fast. It's that addition of player agency that is delivered here as well as potentially the underlying changes to the resource system that has me a little bit more excited personally. Uh, they go on to say that there's also the intent of adding where this mechanic can be utilized to better represent natural and man-made disasters as well, which have affected resource procurement. This also gets my mind thinking about other opportunities, of course, that they go on to talk about a little bit later, related to things like in-game events and how the changes of how these resources are managed could potentially spread out into political events and upheaval in the country, that kind of thing. If a logging camp is depleted, it will be replaced with a clear-cut building, which still produces lumber, but it produces it at a really heavily discounted, reduced rate. The intention here is, of course, that you can still produce a bit, but there's a resource management element added here as well. Go for broke, cut it all down and make a whole load of money in the short term, but screw over your long term prospects or adopt a more sustainable approach to economy and resource management. I like the fact that we may have more choice around that. Here we see more choice added in, but of course, here it's uh, part of a PM, a production method, right? Uh, in this case, we're looking at how we manage resources. And you can see that the example here is that a player can enact different things, different production methods to prevent deforestation, or of course, increase it further, embracing it as much as is needed for throughput bonuses. And here they kind of bring it all home. They talk about some brilliant points about how it adds to the concept or the, the mindset of time. Why, why do I care? I have so many trees. I'll cut them all down. Let's, you know, <laughs> let's make hay while the sun shines. Let's cut through everything and earn as much money as we can. Or do we not? Do we approach it as in line with, say, the conservation movement, 18th and 19th centuries, tying to industrialization, ecological effects, that kind of thing? An underlying theme, man versus nature and effect, they go on to talk about. Or is that even truly our concern? when we're facing extreme radicalization, right? I like that. More player agency, more options. And then it gets a little more experimental and slightly spicier when we think about things like whaling and fishing, where the tragedy of the commons, everybody comes in and grabs as much. The difference is tech scales, but also, of course, the scale of the common good. Uh, here they say that in experimenting with having actions of a neighboring nation affect the resource potential of its neighbors. For example, overfishing in Britain can cause knock-on effects to the eventual depletion of the fisheries in Iceland, Canada, and the US. The scale of these effects are still in the prototype stage, applies to fish and whaling industries. So potentially another way here for us to conduct economic sabotage as well. The final note on resources is around mineral resources. At the start of the game, of course, there's a fair chunk of them available to exploit, explore, but most of them are hidden and require to be discovered and exploited. Mines will have a chance to discover new resources as they start excavation down below. These efforts can be expedited by resource exploration production methods, for example, increasing the educated labor force requirement and likely a more modernized set of inputs as well. In this way, they go on to say that mineral deposits are still greatly important but there is an investment potential in them now as well. The longer you hold and develop the resource, the more you may eventually dig down and get access to. And then finally, in the weird but wonderful section, we're not sure exactly what Mike's up to, they say, but whatever it is, they think it emphasizes the point in the beginning, that there are no guarantees that any of this will make it into the game as is, nor in the future. Then they show this image and say, if any of you have any theories of what you think this might be about, please give the rest of us a clue in the comments below. There are three images. Uh, let's take a look at them now. Here is, of course, the first one. You can see it's a map of the world and then another map of the world. Uh, one, of course, white, the other black. The black one is normal, the white one different. Is this a different map projection, I wonder? Why is India floating in the middle of the ocean, I wonder? A land of the dinosaurs! 
We move along to the second image. My father commands the beholden. This is the president of Rift's heart. A 41-year-old dinosaur liked of the exemplish culture. Rural. Okay. Uh, and then last but not least, we have my father has praised the established. President of Rift Heart. 35-year-old disliked. Can't imagine why. Next week, they'll be releasing another update looking at the remainder of these experimental game jam entries. And they go on to say that that will likely be the last Dev Diary for 2022, as most of the team heads out for their winter, unluggy summer holidays. Returning mid-January, and we'll see them then, and I will see you in the next video. Take care, everybody, and thanks so much for watching. Bye-bye.